Luke chapter number 19. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, and taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one that hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for being a God that's, Lord, so gracious and so better to us than we ever deserve. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in your house this night. Lord, we're thankful Brother Bob's feeling better. We're thankful that you gave Brother Josh and Miss Tina traveling mercies. We're thankful for the same for Brother Jim and Miss Judy. And Lord, we're certainly thankful for this good number out tonight. Now, Father, I do pray for Sister Mary. Lord, we know that uh, she is in your hands. We know that, Lord, you are the great physician. And, Lord, we know that nothing is impossible with thee. And, Lord, it would be no trouble for you to reach down and touch her even this very night. Oh, Lord, you have touched so many in this sanctuary in days gone by. Lord, we know your healing power. Lord, but if it be your will for her to, uh, Lord, have the touch of doctors and the wisdom of doctors and nurses, we pray you'd guide them and give them the wisdom they need. In any case, we pray for Miss Mary that, God, your will would be done. Lord, we commit her to your watch care, trusting that, Lord, you'll take care of your servant. Father, we pray for the Ellis's that have strep throat. You'd be with them. I pray for... Caleb that has strep throat, that you'd be with him. Lord, I do pray for Florence Baptist Temple. Thank you for the stand they've made. God, I pray you'd undergird them. I pray you'd help them. God, I pray you that, Lord, uh, you would use this to thy glory. I pray for that church down there in South Carolina entering a second week of revival. You'd continue to revive them and bless them. God, then fan it throughout this land we might see great revival come in the midst of the great darkness that is over, the veil of darkness over this land. Now, Father, I pray for those that are providentially hindered, couldn't be here, others that are sick, you'd be with them. But for the next few minutes, I pray you'd help us, you'd sit down amongst us, God, you'd speak to our hearts, revive us, Lord, 
save that one nearest hell and get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you and praise you for that as well. For it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. Here we find, as I said, one of Jesus' last parables uh, before he uh, goes to Calvary. Now, uh, you that are students of the Bible know that a parable uh, is an earthly story with a hidden heavenly meaning. We find that this parable is actually written uh, to the Jews. It's for the Jews. Uh, they were interested in when the kingdom was going to show up. Uh, they thought it was coming immediately. Uh, that's why uh, 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 when he rides into Jerusalem uh, and they're all praising him and adoring him, they thought that he had come uh, 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 to restore Israel uh, and recover Israel from Roman rule. Uh, what they didn't realize is he come to be their savior, right. not their ruler. And so this parable is for the Jews. Uh, but can I say that we also can glean from it uh, here in the church and look at it as a parable for the church, not for the kingdom, but for the church uh, and that uh, what God expects out of his people. Now notice a few things about this parable. Uh, first of all, notice the pictures within the parable. In the parable you find that there is a certain nobleman. That nobleman represents the Lord Jesus. Uh, notice that this nobleman goes into a far country to receive a kingdom. Uh, that represents the fact that he ascended back and he's seated uh, at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you and I. Uh, and friend, when he does come back, uh, he is, uh, 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 when he literally comes back, he is going to sit on the throne of David and usher in uh, the kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, uh, we find that it mentions uh, uh, that he has servants, that servants, uh, that represents uh, believers, those that have been born again, those that have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, those that are saved by His grace, uh, those that are blood washed, as Brother James just sang about, uh, those that are on their way to heaven. What a blessing. Uh, 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 we find that uh, He gives His servants a pound. A pound is money, but what it represents uh, is something that God has given to his uh, uh, children, his believers, uh, that he's coming back for uh, with uh, uh, and expecting them to do something with what he gave them. What does that represent? Well, it represents several things. It represents the gospel. He left the gospel with us, and he's coming back expecting us to do something with the gospel. It also represents the Word of God. He's coming back expecting the Word of God to continue to be preached. It also represents faith. He even said when he come back, would the Son of Man find faith on the earth? It amazes me how much uh, 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 God's people operate their lives without faith. Mm. One of the encouraging things to me with Miss Mary is the news she got would destroy a lot of folks that didn't destroy her. And I even noticed some of her, her family that was there that go to church. But their church that they go to, things are built more on feeling and emotion. And they were basket cases. But there was Miss Mary, who her faith is built on the Word of God. And there was a big difference. Mm. And can I say, friend... He does have a peace that passes all understanding. I don't need to know how God's going to do what He's going to do. I just need to know He's with me. Hmm? And the Word of God tells me He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Can I say, uh, it also represents the church. Jesus loved the church and gave Himself for it. Do you realize the church is a gift to us? Do you realize that we are to be good stewards of God's church? Uh, uh -oh, or do you realize that, Brother James, I'm expecting him to come any time. But if he doesn't come, uh, we need to maintain the doctrines of the church and maintain the church uh, so when these little fellows are grown, they have a church. Uh, where would we be today if our forefathers didn't maintain the church? Uh, it also represents, my dear friends, the fruit of the Spirit. 
those things that the Spirit of God incorporates in us and He grants unto us, uh, 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 we are responsible for this. So that pound can represent a lot of things. Make no mistake, the Christian life is a life that we're a debtor to God for. He has bestowed things on us and made us custodians of them that, my dear friends, we can pass on to the next generation, but we can take those things and use them for God's glory so that when He does come, then He'll not look at our Christian life in vain. I don't want the Lord to be displeased with me. Hmm? Notice, if you will, His return. Can I say that the Lord is coming back. And can I say the first time he came as the lamb, the next time he's coming as a lion. First time he came in humility, next time he's coming in honor and holiness. And can I say uh, the first time he came, he came to pay for our sins. Uh, the next time he comes, he's coming to judge. And so it's important to understand that no man lives unto himself, no man dies unto himself. And every one of us must give an account of ourselves unto God. And he's coming to judge us. Uh, so we see this parable has pictures. Notice the very principle of this parable. Look, if you will, in verse 13. The last clause of that verse says, Occupy till I come. That word occupy means to follow business. Now, if you study the Word of God, Jesus on several occasions said that He came to do the will of His Father who sent Him. He came to do the business of His Father. And what He expects out of you and I is to follow in the business of the Lord. We are to occupy, we are to uh, stand firm and stand true and stand for the business of the King. We're to keep the business of the Lord going. That's our job, to follow in the business of the Lord. It amazes me, he called us sheep. Sheep follow. Goats butt. But can I say God's sheep, Brother Bob, in many instances are following, but they're not following in his business. It amazes me how many people uh, have been led astray listening to a wrong voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. We're to follow, we're to occupy till he comes. That's the very principle. Hmm? Can I say when the Lord comes, we need to be found faithful and true. Hmm? It amazes me how many folks know he's coming, but they're not really concerned how they're living right now because they don't expect he's coming right now. Hmm? Brother James' testimony said, you better be ready. He's a come. We see the pictures. We see the principle. Notice the point of this parable. Verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him. Can I say the very point of this whole parable is that we're going to give an account for what the Lord's given us. Hmm? Now, we don't like it. when like, We love it when we're preaching on heaven, when we're preaching how good God is, and about God's amazing grace, and all that. God's a God of love. We love all that stuff. All that's true. But so is the, the, the line where it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Hmm? He's coming, and he's coming, and we must give an account. Now, in verses 16 through 24, you find that three servants are judged. One takes a pound, and he makes ten pounds, and the Lord puts him over ten cities. One takes that pound, he makes five pounds, the Lord puts him over five cities. One takes the pound and he doesn't do anything with it. He hides it in a napkin and he tries to make excuse for that. says, Lord, I know you's an austere man. I know when you came you's going to be expecting your pound. So here it is. Hmm? 
And the Lord said, you knowing that I was an austere man, should have took it and put it in the bank. At least I'd have got some interest on it. Hmm. Now, let me just ask you something right now. I didn't even got to the message yet, but it's gotten real sober. The Lord invested in you when he saved you. He saved you from your sin, paid a debt you couldn't pay. And he pardoned you of your debt. And then he's left you with some responsibility. What has your life done for Jesus since you've been saved? Hmm? Now notice, there's three servants judged. Two are blessed, one's not. So a third, not doing too good. Matter of fact, he takes it away from him and gives it to the man that had ten. Now, a lot of people have the mindset, well, it really doesn't matter how I live. You know, the Lord's going to judge me, and I don't need a whole lot. Just let me go to heaven. Well, you, you've missed the point. Your Christian life isn't about heaven. Your Christian life is about honoring the Lord. But do you realize how faithful you are in this life with what God has blessed you with? Is what He's going to reward you with for the kingdom. Does not the Bible teach that we will rule and reign with Him? Well, when are we going to rule and reign? During the millennial reign of Christ. And for those that have been faithful with what God has blessed them with, they will rule... Uh, cities and rule kingdoms and rule uh, over peoples in the, reign, in the millennial reign. But those that didn't do much with what they had, they're not going to, what they had is going to be taken away. Some of y'all are going to be dog catchers in, heaven, in, in, the, in the kingdom. Some of y'all are going to be uh, uh, street sweepers because you haven't done anything with what God's given you. You haven't done anything with the Word of God. You haven't done anything in your prayer life. You haven't witnessed anybody, invite them to church. You haven't honored the Lord with your life. Uh, and when He comes, friend, and He's disappointed in you now, you're going to be disappointed then. Hmm? See, a lot of people got the mindset that all oh, the ones that sing and the ones that had big gospel quartets and ones that had big campaigns and uh, uh, great preachers, they're going to get all the big rewards. Oh, no, you hang on, neighbor. When you're faithful with a little, God blesses you with much. It isn't what you do. It's the motive behind what you do it in. Can I say, I have a call in my life. God called me to preach, and then He called me to pastor, and then He called me to pastor this church. But can I say, if God never called you to preach, or God never called you to pastor, that doesn't make your life any less significant than my life. And my life's not any more significant than your life. This is what God has for me to do. But God has something for you to do. And it's your responsibility to God to bloom where you're planted. It's not about what our job is for the Lord. It's about how faithful we are with what God's put in our life. You may be like Brother Phil, just a stinking welder. Now, I promise you one thing. Everybody that works around him knows he's a Christian. Does everybody that work around you know that you're a Christian? Hmm? I ain't even got to the message. Some of you already bowed your head and think it's time to pray. But I'm interested here in this very thing. From verses 16 to verse 24, you see there are three servants who are judged. Look with me in verse 13. And he called his, what's that number? Ten servants. Verse 13, there's ten servants. But verses 16 through 24, there's only three who are judged. I want to preach on this thought tonight. I want to preach on where are the seven? Where are the seven? Now, he didn't call them by any other name than servants. They're all called servants. 
and they're all given a pound. So can I just cloud up the, uh, uncloud the, the thought process right now? All of these people had trusted in the Lord. All of them were His servants. All of them received the same gift. Salvation. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Given the opportunity to serve the nobleman. But when he comes back, there's only three of them in the fight. Two of them did pretty good. One of them just treaded water. But where are the other seven? Hmm. Now, I'm not the brightest light bulb in the bunch, but I do know that if everybody that once came to church here, still came to church here, we wouldn't all fit in here tonight. So where are they at? Where are the seven? Can I say, first of all, one's in the hog pen of sin. Now, my dear friends, what breaks my heart is there have been people who have sat under good Bible preaching, who have professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who have been baptized and become a member of a local church, who have tithed their money, who have went out and knocked on doors and invited others to come, who have sang in the choir, who have taught cl uh, t uh, classes, who have preached the gospel, uh, 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 who have sang specials, uh, who have been active in a local Bible-believing church. Uh, uh, but tonight they've turned their back on the Lord. Uh, uh, tonight they're in a hog pen of sin. Uh, uh, some of them are sitting on a bar stool. Uh, uh, some of them are sitting uh, 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 in a house of ill repute. Uh, uh, some of them uh, 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 are uh, hooked on prescription drugs. Uh, some of them are are hooked on illegal drugs. Uh, uh, some of them have left their wives and left their families or left their husbands and left their children. Uh, 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 they're out there uh, uh, acting like the swine. Uh, uh, Jesus warned uh, about a dog returning to its vomit, uh, about a hog uh, swine returning back to the filth of the swine. Uh, uh, listen, uh, there are folks uh, who have tasted the good grace of God, uh, but they've turned their back on the dog son of God who loved them uh, and who saved them uh, and they've trampled his blood under their feet uh, and they're living a life of a sinner tonight uh, can I say there's nothing more degrading to God than that it's one thing when somebody who's never known him, Brother Thad, who cusses him, who lives wickedly, who's uh, vile and, and, and in darkness and in despair and demonic, those things are terrible and Jesus weeps over their souls. But for somebody who has trusted in him and he's been good to them and to them to live a sinful life pricks him far worse than somebody that's never known him. Jesus hates sin. Jesus became sin so he could redeem us from sin. Jesus loves sinners, but he hates sin. And he, there's only one sin he hates worse than any, any other sin, and that's sin in those that he's redeemed from sin. A lot of the crowd out there that live in, a, in, in an abomination to God... He hates more sin in his own children than he does that. Where are the seven? One's in a hog pen of sin. Listen, I'm not being self-righteous tonight. Every one of us fail the grace of God every day. It's different to fail the grace of God and to, and to repent and try to your best to live for God than it is to live in sin. Knowing the grace of God. Can I say? One's in the hog pen of sin. Now, friend, don't look your, down your nose at them. It's only by the grace of God you're not in the hog pen tonight. Left to your own conceits, there's no telling what you could do. You could do far worse than what they're doing. 
And by the way, if they come walking in the doors tonight with hog, hog pen smell on them, uh, we'll love on them. Uh, we'll be glad to see them. Uh, we'll try to get them back to Jesus because uh, uh, Jesus still loves them. Uh, but he hates that sin in their life. One's in the hog pen of sin. Can I say one's in the holler of self-pity? There's something about the psyche of man. Even though the Bible warns us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, we do. We all think we're better than what we are. We always think somebody else is in worse shape spiritually than us. And we got this uh, way of looking in the mirror. I look in the mirror, I see Brad Pitt. Everybody looks at me, everybody else looks at me and sees Dumbo, one of the dwarfs. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we just got that innate ability about us. But what happens is, when we actually look in the mirror and don't see Brad Pitt, we get to feeling real sorry for ourselves. Uh, somebody doesn't shake our hand at church, or somebody doesn't like our singing, or somebody don't like our message, or somebody don't like uh, something about us, or somebody we might to church don't come, or somebody just says something bad about us, or whatever. We want to suck our thumbs and find a juniper tree. Now again, don't think too highly of yourself. Elijah was God's man. Elijah prayed down fire from heaven. You ever done that? Elijah s slew 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove. Elijah was used to change a nation that was pagan back to God. The whole crowd cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Uh, Israel got right with God because of Elijah. Just a few hours later, he gets word from wicked Jezebel, and he heads, he heads for the, the hills. And he's underneath a juniper tree full of self-pity, asking God to kill him. Can I say there's a lot of people, boy, they're going to turn the world upside down for God. They was going to be able to pray, and they was going to be able to do something for God, and witness, and be a blessing to people, and all that. And all of a sudden, something didn't go their way. And tonight, rather than being at the house of God, worshiping God, they're sitting in their living room. Nobody cares about me. Jesus don't love me. I've heard people actually say that God lied to them. Are they crazy? The Bible even makes it clear it's impossible for God to lie. No, they heard one thing, but what they heard didn't come from God. And there are people sitting full of self-pity. Woe is me, woe is me, walking on their lower lip, thinking everybody done them wrong. If you really grasp what we deserve, we all deserve to be in hell tonight. And yet, friend, if you're not careful, you'll be looking for a spiritual pacifier. You'll be sucking your thumb. You'll be, well, the preacher spends more time talking to them than he did me for church. Well, let me help you with all that. You know what the Bible says? You want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. Quit being stuck up in a stick in the mud, and maybe somebody will come and talk to you too, huh? Right. No, we get so full of ourselves. And can I say, when you get full of self, you're headed to self-pity. Where are the seven? One's in the hog pen of sin. One's in the holler of self-pity. Where's the, where's, the, where's the third one, preacher? The third one's home. Third one's home. Now can I say, some's home sick. And we don't want them to come out if they're sick. I don't want, I don't want what they got. I love them, but I don't want what they got. Hmm? They can keep it. That's between them and Jesus. Huh? Huh? Nobody likes being sick. But sometimes people are sick. And can I say God understands that? I understand that. 
That's going to be one of the beauties of New Jerusalem. There'll be no more sickness. What a blessing. Some's homesick. Some's home shut in. There's some that would love to be here, but physically they're not able to anymore. They're shut-ins. They'd love to be here. Some of them watch uh, uh, the live stream all the time. Some of them seen the same service 14 times. It doesn't matter. They're still watching. They love to be here, but they can't. God understands that. And can I say some are home with their lost spouses. Now, if you are here tonight and your spouse with you and your spouse is saved, you ought to be one of the first ones in the altar thanking God you've got a home where your wife and you know the Lord. But I've been at this thing a long time, and I for a long time have known uh, particularly ladies that have come to church when their husbands aren't saved, and, and, and their husbands uh, 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 some of the time give them a hard time for how much time they spend at the house of God and not home. What a blessing when a lady's husband is not saved doesn't mind that she comes to church. But that's not always the case. And sometimes to keep peace at home, she stays home. Hmm? She'd rather be here and sometimes keep peace at home. And I say, preacher, I'd never do that. Well, first of all, never say never. Yeah, amen. Come on. And don't look down your long nose at somebody else till you've walked in their shoes. Because you don't know what you'd do. And when you say stuff like that, you, re you just reveal that you're ignorant. Hmm? I didn't say stupid, I said ignorant. Thought stupid, but I didn't say that. Huh? You don't know what people's going through. You've heard me preach to you for years. You don't know the hurt behind the smiles of people when they come in them doors. You don't know folks that uh, uh, have families that are in a mess and children that are in a mess, uh, husbands that are in a mess, wives that are in a mess, uh, 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 their finances are in a mess, uh, 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 they got needs at home uh, uh, to be fixed, but they can't get them fixed, everything's a mess, uh, and it's all they can do to crawl to the house of God. Uh, and they come in, and they don't want to bring anybody else down, so they come in, they uh, uh, choke up a smile on their face, uh, and friend, if they're not here don't you dare judge them. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible says that we're not to judge another man's servant. I'm just telling you where are the seven. One's at home. One's in the holler of self-pity. One's in the hog pen of sin. Can I say one's hindered tonight? Hmm. Some are hindered earning a living. Now, can I say, there are some ignorant preachers. I didn't get one amen on that. Let me say that again. There are some ignorant preachers. I've heard preachers say stupid things like this. And I know you're not supposed to say stupid in front of children, but hey, that's how I roll. I've heard preachers say, well, if you've got a job where you've got to work on Sunday, quit your job. Was well, the preacher going to pay your bills till you get done one? Huh? Listen, right now, it's pretty simple to get a job. I think we've somewhere, Sydney said McDonald's is uh, 16 bucks an hour. Lord have mercy. You need to go back to work, Marcy. 16 bucks an hour, flip burgers. Huh? Uh, she could be the lunch lady. Get her hair net. Uh, but listen, if you've got a family, $16 an hour isn't real good money. It's good money for you boys. When you get about 15, you need to hit McDonald's, all right? You get free food, too. No amen out of that? <laughs> free milkshakes, freaking free deal, huh? But if you got two or three kids and a mortgage and car payments and electric and cable and all you ain't gonna you know $16 an hour ain't gonna do it unless you're working 400 hours a week hmm? you're not gonna do it can I say there's some people listen to me this pains me brother Charlie this pains me right here 
I'll be 60 this year. Hush. We'll send you back to Arizona. Bro, you're not too far behind me. What happens if you're out of a job? 55, try and find a job making what you're making now with the benefits you're making now. How long have you been on your job? You've been there a long time. 33 years, huh? All right. Go out there and find one like what you got right now that you've worked 33 years for. And the reality is, to his company, he's a liability. Because every year he works from here on in, his health's going to break down. And he's going to hurt their health plan. And the premiums the company's paying for the health plan. So what they'll do is they'll think, man, we're paying him a lot of money. He's eating us up on the, on the health plan. Let's get rid of him and let's hire some knucklehead for $16 an hour. Don't want to flip burgers at McDonald's. Uh, uh, the company's got a better life. Yeah, the knucklehead's not going to do as good a job, but our bottom line will look better. And what's that going to leave him? By the way, I know everybody says, boy, when I get 62, I'm going to retire. You know the average worker now is working well into their 70s? Mm -mm. So you got another 15 years of working. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah, 62. I'm looking at all them grandbabies you're raising. You ain't retiring at 62, Jack. Uh, you got weddings to pay for, graduations. Uh, Colton eats like your dog eats, you know. Uh, you ain't retiring at 62. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Hey, he'll get a job at McDonald's. I know Colton, Colton will do it. Uh, you boys might be too bashful. Colton said, bring it on. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say some are earning a living. They're not working because they desire to work on Sunday and Wednesday. They're working because they have to. Because a lot of them have had that very scenario I said about him happen to them, and they've had to take what they can get. And until God gives them something different, don't judge them. Pray for them. Some are hindered because they're earning a living. Hmm? Uh, listen, and by the way, God understands that because if God didn't understand it, He'd give them a, a situation where they didn't have to work then. Hmm? Some are hindered because they're earning a living. Can I say some are hindered because they're out running errands? Now, get, don't, don't look at me like i got two heads. I firmly believe you ought to run your errands when it ain't church time. But sometimes things happen where you've got to run an errand when it's church, happen, church time. What happens when your water heater goes out? And it's Sunday morning. You've got to get a water heater put in. Hmm? Just don't call Brother Ray and drag him out of church. Uh, sometimes things break around the house and you got to get it fixed. Hmm? Boy, that went over real good. Sometimes you have to go to the doctor when it's church time. Hmm? Sometimes you have an event. You know, stroke and heart attacks don't care what day of the week it is. Amen. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Matter of fact, Christian didn't care that he was coming. You know, we didn't get to go to church. I took victory and didn't even get to go the first Sunday because he decided he was showing up. Huh? There's sometimes no. Sydney was on Sunday. Sydney was Christian was on Saturday. Sydney, she's always been hard headed. Huh? What I'm trying to say is sometimes there are things out of your control and you're hindered. Some are hindered. Can I say this? Some are hindered by events. It's a fact of life. I hate it. But sometimes kids have events on church nights. Mm -mm. I don't know why every time that they're going to have some kind of presentation or special award ceremony they always on Wednesday night I don't know why it is 
other than the fact that it's just the sorry no good devil you'd think they'd want to do it on Friday night when everybody could come they do it on Wednesday they have graduations on Sunday hmm they got ball games they got all kinds of kids events now listen I'm all for kids playing ball teaches them discipline teaches them part of being a, being a part of a team it's good exercise for them but there's a lot of things going on about all this peewee ball and stuff today I'm not for I'm not for you signing your kid to play year round all the time playing every weekend and all that kind of stuff you know what you're teaching your children you're teaching your children ball is more important than God right. occasionally they're going to have situations I understand that but I wouldn't sign mine up if they's gone all the time you're teaching them the wrong thing and I, and, and I make parents mad I do I don't mean to but I make we don't have a Ken Griffey Jr. in the bunch we don't we don't I got a nephew he's in the 8th grade he's already got offers from Indiana Kentucky and Louisville and his second best sport that's not even his best sport he's already got offers 8th grader I know a little bit about some who can and cannot play it's good to have them involved. It's good to get them out doing stuff. That's all good. But we don't have any Olympians. We don't have any pros. I doubt we even have any college. Yeah, get them involved, but don't get them consumed. Mm -mm. Well, I don't want my kids mad at me. You know why a lot of parents are doing it? Because they feel guilty. It's sad. And by the way, you don't have to sign them up for ball to make you feel guilty. You're a sorry parent if you let TV raise them. Just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, uh, it's mom and dad's job to raise them. Uh, well, we shot the air out of that thing right there. But some are hindered by events. There's some things that are out of your control. But I'm pretty sure you get a schedule when you sign them up. And you don't want to change all this stuff if you'll say, uh, no, we're not playing ball on Sunday. We're not doing it. So, well, preacher, they have to be part of the team. No. If enough parents stood up and said no. All I know is used to, when we had a school superintendent here in Boone County, every year the pastors would meet with him and every year we voiced the same thing and all I know is when all three of mine went through school and the last one was only been out a few years they did nothing on Sunday they didn't even unlock the facilities on Sunday and now you got kids playing tournaments on Sunday I'm just telling you if no parents stood up and said no we're not doing it things would change hmm when they can't field a team, they'll change the way they do things. Say, preacher, you're so narrow-minded, you have no idea. All I'm saying is the Lord's coming. He's giving you a pound. Your children might be your pound. Is he pleased? Where's the seven? Hmm. Hmm. I guarantee if that one showed up and he took that pound away from him, you know why the other seven didn't show up? Because they didn't even have the pound left. Where's the seven? Listen to me. Some, there's one who hated their Christian life. There are people sitting in churches who think they're missing out. They think that life would be better if they could be out there partying like the crowd. You say, preacher, nobody hates the Christian life. I'm glad you brought that up. Look at verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. You know why some's not here? They say, the Lord's not going to be my Lord. I'm going to direct my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. 
God's going to have to be pleased with you. You know what you're doing when you're saying, I'm going to ignore the Lord, I'm going to ignore the Bible, I'm going to ignore the church, I'm certainly going to ignore the preacher. You know what you're saying? You're saying, Lord, I hate you. Yeah. Say, so, preacher, I don't like this kind of preaching. I'm just giving you what Jesus gave that crowd there. Hmm? Can I say this? Folks, that their life says they hate the Lord, because they're never going to come out and say that. What they're really saying is, I want to die and go to heaven, but while I'm here, I want to live like hell. And friends, I've seen that for decades. People never come to church. People... You know, drink like a drink like a fish and cuss like a sailor and 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 smoke like a, a chimney. Oh, I know I'm saved. Really? Because I thought when Jesus saved you, he made a new creature out of you. Oh, I know I'm saved. Some of them are, brother Clint. But their life says I really don't love God, because He said if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I got to finish this. Where's the sixth one? He's hardened to his role. You know, you can sit under and sit in church and be here every time the doors open and get hard-hearted towards God. That's why the Bible says the word of God breaketh like a hammer. Cuz sometimes we get hard-hearted. And folks get hardened to their role. Get hardened to the fact that worship is a thrill, not a chore. Mm. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed Brother James and Miss Renee singing. I was looking forward to hearing them sing. It's a thrill to come to church. And yet some think it's a chore. It's because they got it hard. Mm. They get hardened to works. It amazes me they don't have any problem working around the house. They don't have any problem working their job. But boy, when it comes to doing things for the Lord... Just don't have time for it. Mm -mm. They get hardened to their witness. They can talk about their kids, their grandkids. They can talk about the fish they got on the mantle. They can talk about everything but the Lord. It's because they've gotten hardened. Last thing, where's the seven? Where's that last one? Well, honestly, they don't have any excuse. There's some that just don't have excuse. They just don't. Hmm. An excuse really is just words wrapped around lies. They don't even have that. Hmm. Now please know this. God is keeping a record. He's keeping a record of our adjurations to Him, our promises. Remember last revival meeting when you went to the altar and you promised God you'd do this if He blessed he kept his in the bargain, have you? He's keeping a record every time you promise, made a promise to him. It'd be better not to make an oath to God. Amen. Not to make a vow to God. Listen, he keeps records and promises. Keeps a record of our actions toward him. He keeps a record of our attendance for him. Uh, you know, God knows every time you're here and every time you're not here. He knows. Hmm? Keeps an, a, a record of our attitude towards him. Uh-oh. And he keeps a record of our acceptance of him. Do we really embrace what he has to say? Now, all that said, let me just ask you this. How's your pound faring tonight? Because you're going to give an account of it. And he's coming. He's coming a lot sooner than any of us really think. Everybody's worried about who's running for president in 2024. It might not matter, friend. Hmm. He's coming. How's your pound, Farron? Let's all stand tonight. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, it was real eye-opening when I saw... Three, giving an account 
with seven were nowhere to be found. Lord, if we're honest tonight, there's a lot of times we make excuses. A lot of times we're hardened. A lot of times that we just go through the motions. A lot of times that, Lord, we aren't treating you and your pound fairly. Now, Father, help us, Lord, to be busy about the Father's business and following that business till you come. To occupy till you come. Now, God, bless your folks tonight. Lord, thank you for these that are faithful. These that, Lord, have sold out, doing everything they can for the honor and glory of God. Lord, those that are part of the seven, I pray for them. Lord, I pray they'd, their eyes would be open and, Lord, they'd realize where they are. That one in the hog pen, I pray they'd come back and get right. Lord, that one that's full of self-pity, I pray, Lord, that they'd come to the end of themselves. Lord, to get things made right with the Lord. And those that are hindered, those that are, Lord, hurting, those that are facing very, very dire things, Lord, help them. Help all of them. Lord, we're not against them. We're for them. And we know you're for them. So God, do a work in people's lives. Send revival where folks have a zeal for the things of God again. God, help us to put you first because you so richly deserve that. Now, Lord, bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts. And God, get glory to your name. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight unsaved, pray tonight be the night of their salvation. And Lord Jesus, as John prayed, even so, come quickly. For it's in your wonderful name we pray. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.